Good morning, party people, and welcome to a surprise, unscheduled version of Office Hours. Surprise, uh, not just to me, but as to you as well. Uh, SQL Dev DBA subscribed at Tier 1 for two years. Holy smokes, 24 months altogether, currently on a 20-month streak. Thank you, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I'm SQL Dev DBA says, hello, Brent and Chad. Hope you're all well. Super jealous of the Nordic and Arctic adventures. That was great. I had a lot of fun. Just got back from uh, Oslo. Uh, so went to Oslo, Gothenburg, and then all up the coast, coast of Norway to the edge of Russia, and then flew back to the United States. And five uh, days in Iceland before that, too, as well. It's just a, a, always a really nice uh, time to get to that part of the world. It's one of my favorite parts of the world, Scandinavia. Yeah, in Iceland. Just absolutely beautiful. I will have to say, though, not very beautiful in September. September, not really so good. Had a lot of rain, a lot of overcast skies. So the videos that you saw from there from like office hours were pretty representative. There was a, a mix of uh, snow or not snow, uh, uh, rain and overcast and all that. Ooh. Uh, so I wasn't originally going to do any office hours until probably like November, but I just got a hole in my schedule this week. Any live ones, I'm going to continue to do them on the road. I'm going to Miami next week uh, with some friends, but uh, I happen to have a client kind of sort of reschedule today. I cannot tell you enough, no matter how confident you are in your SQL servers, always check your backups. If you had one thing to do Monday morning when you sit down with coffee, go check your backups. I don't mean check the logs to see that they succeeded. Actually restore them. Don't just back them up. Restore them. Go check to see that your restores actually work. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said, oh, don't worry, our backups are working, and I have a lot more dollars than one for that. So I was like, well, I suddenly have uh, the rest of today and all of tomorrow free, and I say free and kind of loosely. I have a huge list of uh, tasks to do around the house. I have to pull one of the cars out of the garage and swap another one in. We keep one car in the dining room, oddly, in the house. And it's the time of year where I'm going to pull the Speedster back inside because it's cold enough uh, now that we don't really want to drive it that often. So people are often surprised that it's cold in Las Vegas, but the winters are actually cold here. It is, uh, let me go look, it's 80 degrees today on the way to a high of 94 but it does get a lot cooler than that really quickly so and especially in the mornings when I go take the cars out for like coffee runs it's usually like 65 degrees outside and that's just cold enough where I don't really want to drive the convertibles which is funny because most it's when most people are usually get more excited about driving them so I'm like, great, let's go through your top voted questions. G Surgeon in the house, good to see you. Merrick asks, hi Brent, what is the best solution to continuously synchronize logins between a couple of SQL servers? The best answer is not to do it. Sounds like I'm cheating, right? The best way to do it is to use groups. Use groups and then put Windows logins in or out of those groups. That way you don't have to continuously change them every time you add an employee or you get fired, one of the two, whichever. Uh, uh, SQL Dev DBA says, what are you swapping the Speedster with that's inside? A 1971 Volkswagen Type 3 Squareback. Have a 1971 VW. It's the thing that came after the Beetle. Uh, and it's a little kind of like a shooting brake wagon kind of thing. And it has a Porsche 914 engine in it as well. Uh, so it kind of speeds along. Next up, this one, oh, Mank DBA says, have you ever walked off a job because the place is beyond help? Yes, and it happens probably several times over the years. Not a lot, but enough that I remember them when they happen. Um, I try to, I have one 30 minute call with the client for free before we get started. And in there, I talk about, okay, what does success look like to you? What is what is it? What will you be happy with uh, at the end of our engagement together? And you learn pretty quickly who on the call is trying to drive towards success. 
and which people on the call are trying to purposely set you up for failure. Because sometimes that actually does happen inside a business. I've, done, I've worked with enough clients now where I feel more comfortable with that, and I've learned techniques where I can pull people back from the brink, uh, but it, it has happened uh, more than I would like just because some companies are. The classic example is I'll, I'll give you one where uh, one client refused to take backups. One client was like, don't worry about it. We can bring all this data back from the dead. They can bring it back from other sources. And I was like, okay, I understand, but I'm not interested. Because I know what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to bring something back from the dead, and somehow my name is going to be attached to that. SQL Dev DBA says, I can just imagine uh, Kitchen Nightmares where Brent walks away from Amy's Baking Company. I love Kitchen Nightmares. It's always been a fun show to watch. It, obviously, Gordon would never be able to sell consulting services like that. You can't be yelling and throwing things at the client and make that work from a consulting perspective. But it's really fun to imagine. The Kazakh says no Cadillac in the dining room then. No, the Cadillac is too wide to fit in the front door. And I actually would love to do it, um, but it's wider. My, I've got double like French doors, and they're 72 inches wide. I've thought about doing a renovation on the front of the house to make it wider, but it is going to be kind of expensive to do that. I really would love to do it, though. Because the thing I really want is a Porsche 917. If I could get a Porsche 917 in the front door of the house, I would do that, like, immediately. I adore those things. Next up, developer who cosplays as a DBA says, your video about deadlocks from a couple of years ago is fantastic. Right on! Your demo was focused on writer-writer deadlocks. Do you think you'll ever do a demo video for understanding and troubleshooting deadlocks between a reader and a writer? Yes, and I've got a blog post on it already. If you search for Brent Ozar selects winning deadlocks, I've got a blog post out there where I show you an example of a select winning a deadlock, which is a kind of a fun, intriguing type thing. Next up, Ethan says, what are your pros and cons of a shared development SQL server? I don't see pros anymore. I don't think there is a good idea, a good winning use case for a shared development SQL server. I would much rather have people developing locally on Docker containers, SQL Server, uh, uh, Developer Edition uh, runs even on Macs. I run it in a Docker container on my Mac, so I, I, I don't see an, a use case where that makes sense. What someone's going to say is, and I'll put a, a puppet up as if I'm the person, I have a 20 terabyte database and we need to do development in it, so we all work together in that one. Okay, I get it, but you could also do that development on an empty copy of the database. You could just put the tables and structures in there and just load the config tables, not load the fact tables with all the data. Just put 100 rows in each of them, because your goal is just to see if the query works, not to get the exact results necessarily. If you do need to get the exact results of a query, then I understand that you may want to have a full copy, but you should shouldn't be editing anything inside that database. Let's see, next up, Zach asks, most of the AWS RDS instances don't support TempDB on local ephemeral storage. That's true. How important do you think it is to have TempDB on local storage? Going to the cloud is about compromise, is about giving and taking. So you can't have everything anymore. In the old days, we as database administrators would be like, I want the fastest CPUs and the most memory and the best storage and the biggest network cards. And they'd be like, why? Because I'm the database person. That doesn't that work anymore in the cloud where we pay for everything that we use. So what you have to ask is, is each SQL server, you have to ask this question about each one of them, is this SQL server bottlenecked on tempdb writes? If it is, then you can either fix that by changing the indexes in the code, which I talk about in Fundamentals of TempDB, or pick instance types that have local solid state for those particular workloads. But you have to review that on a case-by-case -case basis now that you're going to the cloud. You can't just say, gimme, 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 a man after midnight. Shay asks, next up, Shay asks, is there a way that remarks could not be part of the query cache? No. 
SQL Server tracks queries with the comments included. So unfortunately, if any change is made to the query text, that's seen as a new query. What you probably want to do for tracking query sources, if that's important to you, um, you probably want to track it on the application side using third-party monitoring tools or something like the MVC Mini Profiler, which tracks queries where they come from, all that kind of stuff. That's on the application end, though it is not on the SQL Server end. I'm going to ask one that just came in via the uh, chat. SQL guy says, hey, Brent, when do we get an Ask Me Anything from uh, your home in Vegas in the hot tub? Okay, so true story. I almost did today's webcast from the pool. I was this close. Oh, hey, Montreux 1981. Montreux 1981 has been doing a ton of work on the first responder kit. That'll be one of the things I probably have to do today is go review those pull, pull requests. Um, but I was this close to doing uh, this uh, particular office hours from the hot tub. The one thing that stopped me was I have a whole bunch of stuff that I want to get done in the house today, and I didn't want to set up my home studio type gear down in the pool. Um, the hot tub isn't fully plumbed in yet. There, I, We still have to do the electric for that. It's in place. It just doesn't have electric yet. So, of course, there's no water in it either. Uh, but it, we are probably late October, early November on the, did I say that right? Mid-October to late October on uh, having the electric and everything done for the hot tub. So that'll be coming close. You'll get one from the pool before that. Uh, <laughs> Richie says proficient sucks. Yeah, it's been a, our, our long national nightmare. And then we'll do uh, a couple of more, and then we'll end up, uh, I'll do a break, but I'm going to stay in with y'all, but I'm going to uh, break it for YouTube because I'm going to break it into chunks. The next one from Bishal says, we have a database with a table to store document files, PDFs, and docs, and we're using it for full text search. However, this table is so huge and it's giving us a headache. Are there any alternatives where we don't have to store the database or the documents inside the database and we can still use full text? Yes. There is uh, something called filter files, if I remember right. I can't remember the exact name, but if you go to SQL Server's documentation on full text, there's a way that you can have full text search operate on external files. The thing, <laughs> and then Richie echoes here, Richie's like, dear God, why? The, the reason why it hasn't really caught on is that A, SQL Server's full text search isn't very good. B, you're still burning up CPU on the SQL Server, which is like the most expensive place that you could possibly do it. If you search on the blog for Brent Ozar uh, Full Text Stack Overflow, I've got a couple of blog posts explaining why Stack Overflow had to move away from full text search for, for inside a SQL Server and the alternatives that they used instead. That's what I'd recommend. As long as you're going to start making architectural changes, start thinking bigger than that. Full text shouldn't really belong in SQL Server as you're finding out with the scale problems that you have. Uh, X or, uh, Spitfire says, hi, howdy, sir. Uh, Xproof asks a question. Check out the URL on the screen for where you ask questions, just because I go through and uh, hit the top voted questions from there. Your question's absolutely great, and I actually can point you to a, a webcast on it, but I just want to make sure to be fair to everybody who's involved. Oh, I need to adjust the screen just a little bit there. Let's see. Let's move this around here. There we go. Doing it live. What do we have next here? Next up in the queue. Oh, Karthik asks, uh, what is your opinion of Azure SQL's VM SKU recommendations? Does it produce good recommendations? I have never used it in my life. I have never used it, not even once, so I have no opinion whatsoever. Uh, Montro, howdy. Uh, and in case you didn't hear me earlier, Montro, I saw when you subscribed. That was kind of cool. Um, the... Um, uh, pull requests. I appreciate your pull requests from the first responder kit, and I'll be uh, digging into those probably today or tomorrow. We'll see how that goes, because I suddenly had my schedule uh, free up today. Red Utley, Red Utley says, should SQL CPU licensing ever drive VM sizing selection? Absolutely. You don't want to pay for more SQL Server CPU licensing than you need 
SQL Server CPU licensing is extremely expensive, so you want to get the smallest number of cores that you can get away with and still have your users happy. This is a big par uh, a part of building uh, VM sizes in Azure, Amazon, Google Compute, uh, is trying to figure out how close you can cut it on CPU and still get everything else that you need around memory sizing, disk throughput, and network latency. And we'll do one more, and then we'll take a, a short break of non-professional questions before we uh, uh, hit the next round of professional questions. Uh, Miles says, very good morning. Other than the fact that I'm not getting paid for today's work, it's pretty good. RCSI is turned on on one of the user databases. However, we still see selects are getting blocked by insert statements. Any reason why? Please explain. Absolutely. Just because you have RCSI, that's the default. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what those uh, operations are opting into. Individual operations can ask for different isolation levels. They can say begin transaction or set isolation level serializable. They can use hold lock. They can ask for repeatable read. So RCSI is just the starting point, but then queries can modify it. Most likely what's happening is that select is part of a larger transaction or the insert is part of a larger transaction. And that outside transaction is changing the isolation levels. Okay, that's it for that round of questions. For those of you who are watching the recordings, thanks a lot for hanging out and we will see you next time on Office Hours.